Rome, May 5th, 1527. The city is under siege from the north. Encamped in the fields of the Monte Mario, a mutinous Spanish army marching under Emperor Charles V's of Spain's banner has set its sights on Roman treasure. They have yet to be paid, having fought for Charles in northern Italy against the French armies of Francis I at the Battle of Pavia in 1525, and their avarice has only grown since then. Charles de Bourbon, the rebellious French duke, has led this army southwards, preventing them from sacking other cities, notably Milan, hoping that funds from the emperor would materialize. However, they have not, and the loyalty of these troops has only been narrowly secured by extorting Milan's aristocracy out of 40,000 ducats, Ferrara's banks out of 15,000, ransoming important figures, and dipping into the personal funds of the army's generals. Interestingly, the army of Bourbon is in breach of a truce negotiated between Pope Clements VII and Bourbon's superior, the Viceroy of Naples, Charles de Lannoy, which should have signalled the cessation of hostilities between the papacy and Charles's empire. The need for a final sack to satisfy the troops seems to have overridden these diplomatic realities. The situation for Rome is dire. Facing an army of more than 20,000 men, with only a total of 8,000 in defense, they are vastly outnumbered. Rome has managed to muster 4,000 regular infantry, composed of Roman volunteers, and forming the backbone of the Pope's defenses, 2,000 Swiss guards and 2,000 black band soldiers loyal to the Medici family. They are under-equipped, as the city's financial situation has been in decline over the past few months, with many black band soldiers in particular resorting to pawning off their armor to support themselves. The defenders are also poorly trained, with regular infantry being composed primarily of citizens, priests, and monks. The atmosphere on the city's streets is tense, with the night preceding the assault of the Bourbon army being fraught with anxieties, sleeplessness, and the constant raising of the guard. There are also worries that subjects of Imperial Spain that are living in Rome may turn treasonous and aid the Imperial Army in entering the city. May 6th, 1527. The city's residents emerge from a restless night, happy to find that the city had not yet been assaulted. However, their relief is short-lived. As the early hours of the morning bring the Imperial Army's first and final assault. 4 a.m., the assault on the city begins. The gargantuan walls surrounding Rome were built by the Roman Emperor Aurelian, and they remain a formidable defensive instrument, but they are quickly beset by the ladders of the invaders at five locations. The most important three being the Belvedere Square, Porta Pertusa, and between the Porta Trione and the Porta San Spirito, all located near the Leonine city. However, the prior two assaults are merely distractions for a main force to overwhelm a weak point in the wall at the latter location. The initial attempts to break through the papal defenses are met with fierce resistance, with the Imperial Army suffering heavy losses, but their numbers allow for such losses and they merely regroup and reinforce. Additionally, the thick fog that has made the battlefield its home is preventing Rome from using her powerful artillery against the enemy. Regardless, one of the next assaults sees the army's general, Duke Charles de Bourbon, leading from the front. His stark white cloak billowing around him as he aids in positioning ladders on the city's walls. But his chosen attire makes him an obvious target for the city's arquebuses, amongst the black and grey blur of the rest of his army. And he is singled out quickly. He is to die here, the recipient of an arquebus shot. His death 
while momentarily threatening to set his army into a panicked rout, is instead used by quick-witted subordinate commanders to enrage the soldiers and direct their wrath against the city's faltering defenses. For the next few hours, the walls are subjected to repeated assault, with pressure never being reduced. The attackers cycle out tired fighters for fresh ones, while the soldiers manning the city walls become increasingly exhausted. Their sheer numerical superiority means that they are essentially tearing the walls of the city down by hand, brick by brick. Inevitably, as around 6am they breach the city walls, flooding into the streets of Rome as the defenders break into a panic. With commanders Renzo D'Atteri and Orazio Baglione unable to quell the rout. Meanwhile, Pope Clements is praying in the Vatican, ostensibly for the victory of his ragtag band of defenders, not yet realizing that the defense has crumbled and the enemy swarm the city's streets. Some of Rome's more disciplined defenders, composed of a retinue of Swiss Guard and some Roman militiamen, tried to assemble a rear guard for the fleeing defenders, but they are hopelessly outnumbered and after brief but ferocious fighting, they are cut down. Elsewhere, on the River Tiber, roughly 200 Guelph men attempt to secure the Ponte Sisto, with fire support from the Castel Sant'Angelo, but they are overwhelmed by Imperial forces and forced to retreat into the fort. As Imperial troops march through the city, they bring with them despair. Setting fire to the Orsini Palazzo Taverna, raiding stores, raping civilians, slaughtering Romans in the hospital of San Spirito, putting the orphans of Pieta to the sword, and generally committing what we in the modern age would consider war crimes. Some of those present at the sacking exclaim that the Goths, Turks and Vandals have been outdone, a reference to previous sacks of Rome that in the eyes of these contemporary observers pale in comparison to the barbarism they are paid witness. As they come in spitting distance of the Vatican, what is left of the Swiss Guard blocks their advance. They have been reduced to just 189 men, the others either dead, captured, or occupied in the defense of the city elsewhere. This detachment, ostensibly reserved to act as the Pope's personal guard, is led by Caspar Roist, the captain of the Swiss Guard. They have holed themselves up by the Campo Santo Teutonico in an attempt to slow the advance of the Imperial marauders. It is, however, a hopeless task. They fight valiantly, but are faced with an overwhelming enemy, and they are nearly decimated, with only 42 survivors escaping the slaughter with their lives. The captain, Royst, is heavily wounded in the fray, and makes his way, bloodied and ailing, to his home, where he is killed in front of his wife by Imperial soldiers. The dregs of dregs that remain of the Swiss Guard retreat further up into the Vatican, defending the Pope as he escapes to the Castel San Angelo through the Passetto di Borro. The Pope is accompanied in his flight by numerous cardinals, commanders, and foreign dignitaries. Roughly 3,000 Roman citizens also find refuge in the Castel San Angelo, making their way from the city proper, but the majority are unable to reach this safe haven in time, before the drawbridge is raised and the portcullis dropped. In their desperation, Romans are described to have leaped into the river Tiber to escape the bloodthirsty imperial Landsknecht, but many end up drowning. May 7th to June 7th, 1527. In this total ruin and destruction of Rome, the Caesarian army forced its way into the city yesterday. I am writing this to His Excellency Federico Gonzaga to make him understand how extremely terrible it was to witness such calamity. The looting was so intense and extensive 
that anyone seeing it would be deeply touched, kindling the deepest feeling of compassion into those attending such a cruel scene, in so far that even stone would be moved to compassion. Ambassador of the Marquis of Mantua, Francesco Gonzaga. Over the next few weeks, the city would be ransacked, with the Imperial Army gradually reigning in its control of the city, with the insatiable lust for loot, women, and blood being only tempered by the possibility that Rome may be enforced by her allies in the League of Cognac. But they are never to arrive. A League army led by Francesco Maria della Rovere of Urbino would consider a rescue operation on the 22nd of May, but ultimately, against the protests of many papal loyalists, della Rovere elected not to help. Rome was alone. The city's defense had all but collapsed, with the only holdout being the Castel San Angelo which over the coming weeks would be starved into submission. During the sack, the Imperial Army would raid numerous palaces. In many cases, after ignoring the bribes they had been paid not to raid them. One example is that of the Palazzo Piccolomini, which was raided after the owner, Cardinal Piccolomini, paid 35,000 ducats for its protection. This sort of thing would happen to nobles and wealthy individuals all over the city, even those whose allegiance was towards the imperial cause. Even the imperialist cardinals, such as Ponzetti and Vale, were extorted, and if they resisted, beaten within an inch of their life. Ponzetti, for example, died of wounds given to him by imperial marauders. The German Landsknecht mercenaries were particularly brutal, as their Lutheranism meant they had fewer moral qualms when dealing with Catholics, while the Spaniards made it their main business to extort money from the clergy, the Landsknecht declared that they had promised God to murder all priests. With this in mind, many monks, priests and bishops were, in fact, put to the sword including one 80-year-old bishop of Potenza, who upon failing to pay his own ransom, was murdered brutally. Other victims, perhaps more or less fortunately, were only subjected to mutilations of the body, like removal of ears or noses. The nuns of the city were also treated terribly, with many raped, paraded through the streets naked, and, quote, sold in the markets, for two ducats." Unquote. No quarter was given. Additionally, a large quantity of archival material, manuscripts and literature was destroyed during this period, with the libraries of Santo Sabina and various other private collections being incinerated or simply misplaced. The Vatican Library also sustained severe damage, only to be saved by Philibert of Orange as he had elected to set up his headquarters there. By June the 7th, when the Pope and the Imperial Army had negotiated a surrender, the city was but a shadow of its former self. In Rome, the chief city of Christendom, no bells ring, no churches are open, no masses are said. Sundays and feast days have ceased. The rich shops of the merchants are turned into stables. The most splendid palaces are stripped bare. Many houses are burnt to the ground. In others, the doors and windows are broken and carried away. The streets are changed into dunghills. The stench of dead bodies is terrible. Men and beasts have a common grave, and in the churches I have seen corpses that dogs have gnawn upon. In the public places, tables are set close together at which piles of ducats are gambled for. The air rings with blasphemies, fit to make good men, if such there be, wish that they were deaf. I know nothing wherewith I can compare it, except it be the destruction of Jerusalem. I do not believe that if I lived for two hundred years, I should see the like again. <laughs>